This is the second in a series of events celebrating and reflecting on 50 years of women at King's. We're thrilled to be joined this evening by Zadie Smith. Thank you for coming. I'm sure that for all of you, Zadie hardly needs any introduction, but just in case, she came up to King's in 1994 to read English. And while she was here, she wrote and published short stories in the Maze Anthology and was working on what would go on to be her first prize winning novel, White Teeth. The Autograph Man followed in 2002, On Beauty and Martha and Hanwell in 2005, NW and Swing Time in 2012 and 2016. Zadie has also taught creative writing for over a decade at Columbia and NYU. She's a reviewer and critic, essayist, short story writer, and most recently playwright and co-creator with her husband of a children's picture book, Weirdo. It's really wonderful to have you with us. We're going to begin with two readings from her latest collection of essays, Intimation, which were written and published during the COVID pandemic and the lockdown. A conversation between us will follow and then we'll take some questions from the audience. Over to you, Zadie. Cool. Um, uh, I, I was just going to say, I have a brace in my mouth at the moment, so if I lisp more than normal, that is the reason. Um, it's behind my teeth, that's why you can't see it. Um, I'm going to read two uh, short essays from this book, uh, this tiny book, Intimations. The uh, first one's called Something to Do. I might have to put some specs on getting old. Um, if you make things, if you're an artist of whatever stripe, at some point you'll be asked or may ask yourself why you act, sculpt, paint, whatever. In the writing world, this question never seems to get old. In each generation, a few too many people will feel moved to pen an essay called inevitably Why I Write or Why Write, under which title you'll find a lot of convoluted, more or less self-regarding reasons and explanations. I've contributed to this genre myself. Only a few of them are any good, and none of them, including my own, see fit to mention the surest motivation I know, the one I feel deepest within myself and which, when all is said, done and stripped away, as it is at the moment, seems to be at the truth of the matter for a lot of people, to wit, it's something to do. I used to stand at podiums or in front of my own students and have that answer on the tip of my tongue but knew if I said it aloud, it would be mistaken for a joke or fake humility or perhaps plain stupidity. Now I'm gratified to find this most honest of phrases in everybody's mouth all of a sudden and in answer to almost every question. Why did you bake that banana bread? Oh, it was something to do. Why did you make a fort in your living room? Well, it's something to do. Why dress the dog as a cat? Well, it's something to do, isn't it? It builds the time. Out of an expanse of time, you carve a little area that nobody asked you to carve and you do something. But perhaps the difference between the kind of something that I'm used to and this new culture of doing something is the moral anxiety that surrounds it. The something that artists have always done is more usually cordoned off from the rest of society. And by mutual agreement, this space is considered a sort of charming but basically useless playpen in which adults get to behave like children making up stories, drawing pictures and so on. So at least they provide some form of pleasure to serious people doing actual jobs. The more utilitarian minded defenders of art justify its existence by insisting upon its potential political efficacy, which is usually overstated. And artists themselves are especially fond of overstating it. But even if you believe in the potential political efficacy of art, as I do, few artists would dare count on its timeliness. It's a delusional painter who finishes the canvas at two o'clock and expects radical societal transformation by four. And even when artists write manifestos, they are hopefully aware that their exigent tone is finally borrowed, only echoing and mimicking the urgency of the guerrilla's demands or the activist protests rather than truly enacting it. The people sometimes demand change. They almost never demand art. As a consequence, art stands in a dubious relation to necessity, to time itself. It is something to do, yes, but when it is done, whether it's done at all, is generally considered a question for artists alone. 
An attempt to connect the artist labor with the work of truly laboring people is frequently made, but always strikes me as tenuous. The fundamental dividing line being this question of the clock. Labor is work done by the clock, paid by it too. Art takes time and divides it up as art sees fit, something to do. But the crisis has taken this familiar division between the time of art and the time of work and transformed it. Now there are essential workers who don't need to seek out something to do, whose task is vital and unrelenting. And then there are the rest of us, all with a certain amount of time on our hands. Not to mention an economic time bomb, which for many people exploded within the first few weeks in my New York within the first few days. One of the radical political possibilities of our new revelatory expanse of free time, as many have noted, that it might create a collective demand to reassess and reconfigure as a society how we protect the rights of those whose work exists only in the present moment, without security or protection against unknown futures, the most obvious unknown future being sick leave. The rest of us have been suddenly confronted with the perennial problem of artists, time and what to do in it. What strikes me at once is how conflicted we feel about this new liberty and or captivity. On the one hand, like pugs who've been lifted out of a body of water, our little limbs keep pumping on as they did when we were hurrying off to our workplaces. Do we know how to stop? Those of us from Puritan cultures feel work must be done. And so we make the cake or start the gardening project or begin negotiation with the other writer in the house for those kid free hours each day in which to work on something. We make banana bread, sew dresses, go for a run, we do something, then photograph that something and not infrequently put it online. Reactions are mixed even in our own hearts. Even as we do something, we simultaneously accuse ourselves. You use this extremity as only another occasion for self-improvement, another pointless act of self-realization. But isn't it the case that everybody finds their capabilities returning to them, even if it's only the capacity to mourn what we've lost? We had delegated so much. It seems it would follow that writers, so familiar with empty time, with being alone, should manage the situation better than most. Instead, in the first week, I found out how much of my old life was about hiding from life. Confronted with the problem of life served neat, without distraction or adornment or superstructure, I had almost no idea what to do with it. Back in the playpen, I carved out meaning by creating artificial deprivations within time the kind usually provided by pe for people by the real limitations of their real jobs. Things like a firm place to be at 9 a.m. every morning or a boss who tells you what to do. In the absence of these fixed elements, I'd make up hard things to do or things to abstain from, artificial limits and so on. Running is what I know. Writing is what I know. Conceiving self-implemented schedules, teaching day, reading day, writing day, repeat. What a dry, sad, small idea of a life. And how exposed it looks now that the people I love are in the same room to witness the way I do time, the way I've done it all my life. For me, the cliche is true, only way out is through. Trying to preserve some space for yourself in the crowded domestic sphere feels like obsessively cupping your hands around thin air. You carve it out, the time you need, after much anxiety and debate, get into the separate space and look between your hands, and there it is, nothing. An empty victory. At the end of April, in a powerful essay by another writer, Atessa Moshveg, I read this line about love. Without it, she wrote, life is just doing time. I don't think she intended by this only romantic love or parental love or familial love or really any kind of love in particular. At least I read it in the platonic sense, love with a capital L an ideal form, an essential part of the universe, like beauty or the color red, from which all particular examples on earth take their nature. Without this element present in some form, somewhere in our lives, there really is only time and there will always be too much of it. Busyness will not disguise its lack, even if you're working from home every moment God gives, even if you don't have a minute to spare, to fill all of that time without love, or feel empty and endless. I write because, well, the best I can say for it is it's a psychological quirk of mine developed in response to whatever personal failings I have. But it can't ever meaningfully fill the time. 
There is no great difference between novels and banana bread. They're both just something to do. They're no substitute for love. The difficulties and complications of love as they exist on the other side of this wall, away from my laptop, is the task that is before me. Although task is a poor word for it, for unlike writing, its terms cannot be scheduled, pre-planned or determined by me. Love is not something to do, but something to be experienced, something to go through. That must be why it frightens so many of us and why we so often approach it indirectly. Here is this novel made with love. Here is this banana bread made with love. If it weren't for this habit of indirection, of course, there'd be no culture in this world and very little meaningful pleasure for any of us. Although the most powerful art, it sometimes seems to me, is an experience and a going through. It's love comprehended by, expressed and enacted through the artwork itself. And for this reason has perhaps been more frequently created by people who feel themselves to be completely alone in this world and therefore wholly focused on the task at hand than by those surrounded by loved ones. Such art is rare. We can't all sit cross-legged like Buddhists day and night meditating on ultimate matters, or I can't. But I also don't want to just do time anymore the way I used to. And yet in my case, I can't let it go. Old habits die hard. I can't rid myself of the need to do something, to make something, to feel that this new expanse of time hasn't been wasted. Still, it's nice to have company. Watching this manic desire to make or grow or do something that now seems to be consuming everybody, I do feel comforted to discover I'm not the only person on this earth who has no idea what life is for, nor what is to be done with all this time aside and filling it. Um, this second essay is short, it's just a little thing. But when I was um, in lockdown, like all of you, I'm sure, I just missed people, seeing them around. And so I found myself writing little bits Memories from earlier in the year or from the year before, just people. This one's called An Elder at the 98 Bus Stop. Is that Sadie? You don't remember me, do you? I'm Keisha's mum. I don't think she was in your year as it goes. I know your mum, though. I knew you when you was a baby. I seen your mum not long ago in the high street. She was looking well. She didn't say you was back. Yeah, we're doing all right. Still Stonebridge, still in the ends. I just got off a bus and was heading home, but when someone calls me by my name, by my real name, I listen very closely. I attend to the speaker as to an auntie or uh, to an elder. And here was an obvious auntie, mighty bosomed in a V-neck t-shirt she'd deliberately taken a pair of scissors to in order to drastically deepen the decolletage. And wearing a pair of dark indigo jeans, studded with diamante, skin tight, hugging every curve as they say. The whole back line of her body spoke of power and youth, although by the local coordinates she was giving me, whose cousin knew which sibling's girlfriend at what time, I understood she must be an elder, even if she didn't remotely look like one. I took my backpack off and sat down on the paltry four inches of plastic that long ago replaced the sturdy bus stop benches of my childhood. I got ready to receive whatever was coming. It was a bounty. You know where I'm headed? Doctors. You know why? It's this bloody menopause. I sympathized, but as it turned out, I had completely the wrong end of the stick. No, I'm going in there to demand he brings it on. I'm 58, what am I still doing with periods? This can't go on no longer. You know what? My, when my poor mum got the menopause? 63 years old. And there weren't no one in Clarendon to bring it on for her. She just had to suffer it. Not me though, I'm done. I'm walking right in there and I'm demanding he brings it on right now, because it's just silly business at this point. I got the fear I'm going to be one of them miracle mums on the news. No, I'm only teasing you, though. But for real, enough is enough. I want that menopause today. Say hello to your mum for me, yeah? This is me. You're not getting on? Oh, okay, I'm heading Cricklewood way. Good to see you. All right, then. Wish me luck. It's not often you meet a fertility goddess at the 98 bus stop. So she's, <laughs> she stayed in my mind as a symbol of a certain uncontained and uncontainable fecundity a natural abundance, which I suppose I sheepishly connect in my mind with Jamaica, with its residents, its diaspora, Bougainvillea, hills, gullies, music, stories. A typical second generation question to ask yourself, how did all that prior abundance fit into this new habitat, into these boxy rooms in drab estates, these flats, these flower-free high streets, these narrow rambling buses, rumbling buses, sorry. When you were a child, you looked up at your mother wrapped in gloves and scarves, shivering on the top deck, and tried to conceive of her earlier 
incarnation, barefoot in a pristine brown and yellow uniform, walking towards the one-room schoolhouse, but not too quickly because of the heat and stopping every now and then to smell huge purple flowers. It sounded like impossible nonsense, yet somehow it was true. Containment is terrible anyway, but how much more frustrating it must be if somewhere in the memory, even if it's only in the epigenetic memory, wide open spaces remain, now utterly out of reach. When lockdown arrived in England, I, I thought of this fertility goddess and of the small flat on the Stonebridge estate, routinely described in English news stories as the notorious Stonebridge estate, that now contained her more tightly than usual. And of course, of the larger Wilsdon masonette that contains my mother. The strange storytelling of video conferencing began between my mother and me, where two or three storylines run concurrently, catch up on the latest every few days, while you simultaneously stare at your own face. A surreal new advance in human conversation it leads to the self-conscious adaptation of one's own emotional responses in direct response to how you feel they might look aesthetically. My mother's three stories were one, the PPE situation in her workplace, which at that moment was a ward for schizophrenic mothers, and the situation was that there was none. Two, updates on the rest of her family, and three, the progress of her half of the garden, which was going splendidly. Pansies and clematis and magnolia and vibrant array, abundant. Flowersome, as she puts it. And so it went for a few weeks, no PPE, or family still fine, ever more abundant and flowersome garden, until one day when I asked about my little brother and my mother began one of those long, confusing chains of local lineage, just as the fertility goddess had six months earlier about so-and-so, who knows, oh, you remember, what's her name? Who's the cousin of who's it? And anyway, your brother knew her. She was in his year and her boyfriend killed her last night in her flat in Stonebridge. Poor, poor thing. What? No, 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 no. This girl was young. She's in Luke's year. You're not listening to me. You never listen properly. Anyway, this lockdown is driving people crazy, maybe. I don't know. It's just so sad. And then he set the flat on fire and it's been burning all night. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. If, I, if I can, I'm going to ask some questions that speak to the collection as a, as a whole, in case some of the audience haven't read all of the essays. I've been wondering about the word intimations. I know it's a cliche to begin with the title. Right. But you mention it in relation to um, Aurelius, what you've learned, and also in the debts and lessons section of the, of the collection, where you say that there are intimations still in progress, love and laughter. It's got two meanings, hasn't it, that word? So a kind of suggesting by a hint or a gesture, something quite restrained. But historically, it's also meant a formal announcement, right. a kind of, it can even mean a, a declaration of war uh, or a judicial notification. Right. And I was thinking about that and reflecting on the anger that I can hear in the, in the collection. And I just, I wondered what it was doing for you, that word. Um, I think of intimation, because you're right, it has this double meaning. And for a novelist, it's more like, because what we do is so absurd, you're declaring things that aren't, true that you barely understand that, that are almost non-existent in the world so it's a kind of official word for something so um ambivalent and strange um and i i really thought of it as a, a book of things i didn't understand and couldn't really process that that was the kind of mind state i was in um and the only thing i really uh wanted to do um was in some way be helpful that's not normally a thing that i I'm involved with being helpful, but um, it was the kind of situation where everybody felt that they need to be helpful. And I was first in New York and then in London, often surrounded by people with, uh, you know, skills who were doing, working for the ACLU or on the streets or I couldn't, especially when you have small children, you can't, there's a lot you can't do in terms of uh, direct action. So I just thought, well, I, I can do this thing. This is what I can do. and. So it was a kind of very, um, even though my intimations are uh, only intimations, it had a kind of focused point, which was make money. And I've never really written a book with such a obvious uh, reason. Like normally when you're writing a book, you have no idea what you're doing or why. 
this is the first my first experience of writing something for a simple purpose. Did that? Do you think that freed you a little? I was thinking about the introduction to your Changing My Mind right. collection of essays, where you talk about a certain kind of writer who's on the hunt for purity and perfection. I think you describe it as a, a white male, usually. And you say, novels, unwieldy, baggy, embarrassing, I think is a word that you use, but maybe in the form of the essay, you can, you can approach closer to that. Right. But you also say in this collection that the essays are short and sort of... Yeah, I mean, it was... A, it was a, Everything about it was restraint. Like, I, the only reason it's written at all is because my husband took the kids for four hours, five hours every day and so that I could write it. So everything about it was uh, contained. And I just had... To, I would go into this room. Uh, you know, you're homeschooling at that point, so it's not nothing for someone to take the kids for more than their half of the day and homeschool and try and write their own poetry and do their own work. And so it was an incredibly generous thing on his part, but it meant that the time I had, I had to really, um, you know, I just didn't have any time to waste. And I was trying to get it out as quickly as possible so that the money would be of use, you know. And you return to this question of time over and over again in something to do. You use the word carve out time more than once, time bombs, shortness of time. Free yeah. time. It has been extended to me by quite a bit of time. Yes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I, I was, I was thinking about the difference between thinking about time, writing about time as a phenomenon, but also your craft as a writer. So writing with time, in time. And I was hoping you might be able to tell us something about about that. Perhaps there's a writer that you've read or are interested in who's particularly accomplished at it, or Maybe this is something you've been working I mean, on is, I guess for me at this point in my life, uh, maybe it will change again. I had more kind of metaphysical ideas about time when I was young and maybe they'll come again. But in this period of my life, time just means, uh, you know, how long are the children in school and how much time do I have? That is that is the very basic meaning of time to me. <laughs> and uh, I, I'm always just trying to get things done you know in in that space of time and but it, it sounds like a banal thing but in fact it has all kinds of aesthetic consequences so I mean I've ju just written this long not that long don't worry novel uh set in the 19th century it's a, I guess it's a kind of a toy novel but the, the chapters are very short and that's both uh necessity in terms of the kind of time I have it say but it's also become you know a, a pleasure like it, it's an aesthetic principle mm -hmm. I guess if I didn't have kids and I was just sitting around, like they might be 400 pages long each other. But I, I, the idea of this minimal thing came from necessity, but ends up being, you know, interesting. You've written before the pandemic, though, about dance and, and writing. Tap dancing appears in swing time. I'm thinking even in the uh, Elder at the 98 bus stop, that overlaying of the crap plastic seat on the sturdy bench that was once there. So you've clearly been thinking about what, what fiction can do with respect to, you describe it as kind of bending time and space right. to, your, to your will. I'm just kind of interested in how people experience time, how they actually experience it. And, and partly it's, um, you know, the shape of a novelist's imagination is partly out of their control. Like every time I sit down to write a novel, I have this beautiful you know, 105-page novella in mind, I promise you, every single time, with a timeline which is completely direct and just one character maybe walking, meditating or something, <laughs> whatever. <laughs> one of those chic books you kids like. But it doesn't work out that way. Um, and always the, the time scales uh, go back and forth like that, almost in a loop. And I, if I had to kind of... Um, if I had to kind of psychoanalyze it, I would think what it's possibly about is if you if you are a completely um, discernible or understood subject, then you don't you're not always imagining you're not always having to counter people's projections upon you. Always, if, if, but if you're the kind of subject I am, then you're always aware not only what you of what you think or what people think of what you think or what they think. So the logic of the narrative comes partly defensive, but always covering every angle, which also means time gets messed up because you're not just yourself and your body. You're also subject to an enormous amount of uh, fantasy, projection, ulterior narrative. And I think that might, might be 
the reason. Do you think that you write about this strange and overwhelming sense of death that kind of appeared in our lives, um, always been there for some, but came out of the blue for us? Um, you also write about the explanatory gap that you wonder how people who've always encountered that are sort of disjunct between their experience of the world and what's happening in the world. Have you a sense yet, do you think, if any of the recent changes in our way of being have made their way into your, into your writing? Yes. Um, I think the biggest change for me would be a people who understood, really understood that there were going to die, existentially speaking. And I, I don't think that's um, happened yet. I mean, I do. I, I, I might be wrong, but I, just, I think if people really thought they were going to die, they, they wouldn't spend maybe eight and a half hours looking at a screen. I don't think they would do that. If they really believed that they were going to die and die forever and eternally and never, I don't, I don't think you do that. There must be a level of of self denial in order well, to it's allow. It's an old idea, isn't it? Right. Keep the end. Keep the end in mind. Right. To live well is to keep right. your, your old death in mind. I guess I was wondering about this shift between thinking about it, our endings, as being somehow in the future to be encountered at a time right. not yet, and then that sense of it being interwoven with daily existence, which of course it always is, but. It always is, but but deep, me too. Like it's uh, my ability to look death in the face is like once every fifteen years for about five seconds. This is a this is a normal human response. But I, I guess when I'm writing, at least I get the chance to um, uh, I don't know, just be in time in a non distracted way. That's how it feels anyway when I'm writing. That I'm just kind of present, as people say. <laughs> <laughs> It's interesting that you use the word people say, because the other thing that I was uh, hoping to speak to you about is, is vocabulary. Right. So you have this quotation from Grace Paley at the start of the essays, which says essentially, uh, my vocabulary is adequate for writing notes and keeping journals, but absolutely useless for active moral life. And the essays themselves seem to me at least, correct me if I'm wrong, to then return to this question, well, it's two questions. One about kind of moral testing, moral anxiety. You speak about your cowardice, you having to, to confront that. Um, but also about a search for vocabulary to try and handle the state that we're in, whether that be the pandemic right. or the climate crisis, the fragility of the future. Um, yeah, can you? Do you want to speak to either of those? Like, I mean, maybe you don't connect that quote the way is, I have. It's <laughs> kind of um, uh, ironic, as far as Paley's concerned, because she was an extraordinarily active moral agent, practical person, three children, involved in the feminist movement, the anti nuclear movement, on the streets of Greenwich Village every day, and also finding this, uh, this language. Um, I'm tempted to call it like her, she would have thought of it as a womanly language or womanist language, maybe in the kind of Alice Walker sense, but a language that was her own, that was not at all like the kind of great American beasts of the novel who were all around her, these great American men. It was very intimate. Um, a lot of the metaphors in Paley's work come from the domestic sphere and they're not, um, she has no contempt for them. Like she, she's proud to compare something to, you know, the pipe that goes between a sink and the tap or that's where she finds meaning and she ennobles those things and ennobles these things which are supposedly the realm of women to the highest level of literature so she was in no way um inactive and she it was extraordinary in creating her own language and so from that point of view for me as a kind of uh, role model or just just the idea of not accepting um the language that is given but the one thing i'm often struck by Particularly, you know, I was educated here in, in uh, post-structuralism and deconstruction, right? So one, one of the things I grew up believing is, is, is that language is not an essential thing. It's not essentialized. It doesn't drop from the sky and then you believe any concept that is presented to you. You have to think every example through. Um, so that's important to me. Just out of pride, personally, I, I don't like to um, use language 
buy an album living as if it were my own language. That really depresses the hell out of me. And some of the work the essays seem to be doing is holding on to and making certain words work hard, like submission, for right. example, or um, care, or you know, there's 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 lots of yeah. there's lots of words where you want to give them or look at them from a slightly different angle, perhaps. Yeah. They don't need reclaiming necessarily, but yeah. the new emphasis. Yeah. You say that you, uh, people must ask you this all the time, but you talk about cre creative writing as being kind of controlling experience. Um, you say that your department should be called the department of controlling experience. Um, I think I read that awry to start with, um, and I wonder if that's intentional. So I interpreted it to mean controlling as an adjective. So the idea of a controlling experience well, that, then, yeah. that then shapes uh, how you view the world and the lens that you have on it. Um, I don't think you meant that. I think you meant bending and shaping the, <laughs> shaping yeah, I, the world. Yeah, a little bit, um, yeah. Is there anything in that, though? Because I was then reflecting on if that's a way of understanding how potentially our different experiences of the last few years can, can sort of be it's one way of thinking about how they how they do. I think uh, the, the way novelists use language to kind of pin down their experience and to basically uh, nullify it to get rid of it almost or to to leave it in aspic so it doesn't you don't have to deal with it anymore um, is not a healthy thing for civilians <laughs> to undertake as a, as a way of living you know I think you have to remain in your experiences and live through them and uh, I, I know a lot of novelists, I think, who have that slightly sickly feeling that they've um, distorted their lives somehow in, in these books. You know, the book about your mother's death or the book about it, it's as if your mother's death is in there in the book and it's gone. It, it really is quite a childish process, you know, a kind of uh, psychological self-protection thing. And you resist the idea that it's some kind of simple sort of writing of oneself onto the, onto the page. It never has been for me, but it might be for others. Is that, you use the word task of writing, and I think I've read elsewhere in your, in your work that you think of it as kind of organising or a way of thinking on the page or of getting ideas or feelings into some kind of co coherence, if that's the right word. Is, is, that, is that the work that you... Or into are some kind of music. Like, I, I don't have a kind of essentialist views about... Uh, peoples or the characteristics of peoples but when I do think of the African diaspora from which I am a kind of distant member I do think of rhythm and music not as a kind of essential thing that runs through our blood but something deep in the tradition going back hundreds of years and for me when I'm writing novels I'm arranging ideas into a kind of form that's musical to me you know that it's a pleasure to revisit just like listening to a song it's like taking I always try and describe it to my, I don't teach anymore, but I used to describe it to my students. Like when you walk in a house, an architect is taking your free will, your movement, your way of being in the world and manipulating it. You have to move through a house in a certain way. And beautiful buildings preserve a certain way of moving and being. And beautiful novels do exactly the same thing. You are a free, independent person with your own ideas. But for the duration you're reading a novel, a good one, hopefully, you are being forced. It's quite an <laughs> aggressive thing to move this way, dance this way, move to this rhythm, see things in this way. Of course, when the book is closed, you're free to, um, you know, burn it if you, feel, if you feel badly about it. But while you're in it, you're entering into the house of somebody else's um, aesthetic arrangement. And in my case, it, it is rhythmic by design. And we could hear when you, when you were reading the capacity you have for picking up other people's voices or the kind of rhythms of their speech but it's also isn't it a kind of rhythms of, of rhythms of thought if you see what I mean yeah or kind of uh shapes and movements and connecting threads I mean that's what I love I mean aside from being a I mean I I, I writing's fine but reading the pleasure of reading and of constantly being pushed into a whole different rhythm a whole different uh music is what is like what I what I live for and I, I think what sometimes I find hard about algorithmic language I'm sure you've all felt it sometimes you'll be online you can be online all day 
you read a thousand different sites, but you have the sense that the whole thing's been written by one person. This persistent voice, it's the same goddamn voice, it's everywhere. They even say the same phrases, the same hashtag. To me, that's, it's like, I, I can't bear that. I can't bear the idea of being stuck in this one voice designed by 10 guys in Silicon Valley. It like drives me, I feel like I'm being driven mad by that voice. Deadening. Yeah, Dead. it's deadening, it's deadening. Whereas every time I pick up a novel, a record, any, any human product, um, I'm in the rhythm of somebody's uh, mind, consciousness, way of looking. It's, it's not their biography. I don't really care who they are or what they did. Or It's just the way their mind works. I'm, I'm in that rhythm. And that, to me, is the pleasure of it. I feel their, feel their energy. Yeah, their vibe. Okay. That's just the yeah. best word for it. Yeah. Their vibe. Yeah, yeah. It sounded like you... In absorb some of the Cambridge way of going about <laughs> teaching in what you were just saying in, in that primary emphasis on reading carefully and yeah. a lot. Um, yeah. I'm, I'm not just reading, looking, listening, listening anything that being, involves your senses. Being open, being, yeah. being receptive. Um, could, you, could you tell us a little bit about how you go about the, the process, the work, the art of, of teaching? creative writing? I mean, I never really, I mean, I'm, I am in that department, but I actually uh, I kind of got a special dispensation to teach literature, basically. So I was teaching uh, literature to students who I knew wanted to write novels. I just never read any of their novels, if you see what I mean. I made them write essays and I read their essays because I didn't know how to teach creative writing. I wasn't taught creative writing, so it's not something that I can do. I was taught literature and that's the only way I know how to become a writer. So that's that's what I taught. Um, and then sometimes I'd have, you know, uh, MPhil students, as you would call them, who were writing novels, and I'd read those, um, but more rarely. But my main class was undergraduates, 18, 19 years old, teaching, you know, a literature club, mm -hmm. course and, of the 20th century. And do you go about it the way that you were taught? Or I imagine there are some people in here who did actually teach you, or have you, have you um, come to a different or at, nuanced? At level? first, I taught it exactly as I've been taught, and I had a mass uh, riot on my hands because <laughs> I was in America and my students were totally not interested in any of it. Um, so I tried to do that at Harvard, then at Columbia, and I gave up at NYU basically and tried to adapt a little bit more to what they wanted. But also, you know, it was interesting. Uh, the way they thought about literature is so different from the way I thought about it. And so it's an education. So we, we kind of met each other in the middle somewhere. No, no more rioting. No, I became less stiff and they became a little more structured. It was good. That's good. <laughs> and has that, that experience of teaching yourself, of having children of your own, of all of the accomplishments that have... Uh, you know, been achieved by you. Do you look differently now when you look back on your time here at King's? I don't know. I mean, that's the thing about events like this. Like, my life is not that interesting. It's a kind of seamless continuation. I go to libraries, I write a book. I've been doing that for 20, whatever it is, 30 years now or something like that. So it's it doesn't feel that different to me. I In NYU, I wrote all the books I wrote in America, I wrote in the Bob's library, you know, and now now I write more in my house, but um, I was writing in libraries. I wrote here. I, it's just the same to me. Question of time, some quiet um, and books being, you know, nearby. And that's all I need. I'm not I'm not I don't have one of these elaborate like juju things of needing a special space or I don't I really don't care. Just laptop earplugs. I'm good. I guess I was thinking more about, you know, I'm not going to ask you, what would you do differently if you had your time again? It's not that kind of question, really, but it's just that once you're on the other side, as oh, it were, yeah. of thinking about how it is that you teach and how it is that you, you know, nurture the students that you encounter and so forth. I just, I kind of am interested if when you look back at your own life as a student or the community or lack of it that you found here at King's. You know, it's on the way here. Like I was completely unnurtured in the sense you mean, but but um, it wasn't existential. Like I was thinking, when I came here, my mum drove me in, <laughs> we didn't have a car at the time, she drove me in Brent Social Services van, this massive red van, so Brent Social Services on the side of it. Um, so I came there 
I came to a place, I had a full grant from my council. My father had just been given a, a flat in, by the sea, full grant from the same council. I came here completely for free. This is not an existential situation, right? So all the annoyances, all the things, like they're annoying when somebody is, you know, microaggressive, whatever, but it's not existential. It's like, it can be comic, it can be irritating. I can write a bitchy essay about it, but it's neither here nor there. I came to do my course. I wasn't, like, as they say on the reality show, I didn't come to make friends. I didn't need some intimate relationship with my professor. I just wanted to learn stuff. If you come and you have to pay and you're struggling and you can't pay your rent and your parents are so that's a different matter. So it's really not surprising that these incredibly tense relationships between generations, between professors and students arise when it is existential and economic. It wasn't like that in my case. And what would you say in the US or here or both are the most kind of pressing things that are imperiling <laughs> higher education? Money. Money. <laughs> it means it. I, it would not have come. What, what does it cost now? Nine grand? I wouldn't have been here. There was absolutely no way I would have been here. I would never have taken a loan. My mom wouldn't have let me, and I would never have been here. So that it's just, it's not complicated from that point of view. And from fixing, if that were a possible thing to do, the money situation, you think that other problems problems don't disappear, but again, they become not existential. They become things you can deal with socially, between people, you can discuss them, you can argue with them. It's not red in tooth and claw. Once it's red in tooth and claw, you can't talk. There's nothing to talk about. We need to focus our attention on getting people here and making sure that they can live so that they can learn. Right. Okay. <laughs> I'll, try, I'll try that. Um, I'm going to ask if the audience have any questions in just a minute, but... Uh, just one last one last question, and I hope that the answer isn't too um, negative, but it may well be. So you, you say that this opening up of an endless expanse of free time may have radical political possibilities of a capacity maybe to, you think you use the word, reconfigure um, how as a society we protect the rights of those who work um, only in the present moment key workers, et cetera. But more broadly, I think you're saying this time has given us a moment to reconfigure lots of things. I mean, have you seen any sign of that yet? I mean, I'm no uh, <laughs> political scientist, as you may have noticed, um, but uh, there's, there's the, the structural spring back, which is depressing, but also the personal. But you know that as, as a novelist, psychologically, you know how hard it is to retain the memory of pain in the, for individuals. It's really, really hard. And if you're relying on people's feelings or their empathy or whatever, then you will not get very far because that's not the kind of people we are. So it does, it, it does need to be structural. Our hands need to be tied because we're, we're not, um, our feelings don't get us very far. My empathy doesn't last very long. Retaining the feeling of pain, it's curious that that sounds like it would be awful, but it's in fact vital. Yeah, it's vital. Um, and we're speaking from a position of kind of relative privilege on, on that. And to speak of others' pain, obviously right. impossible. Yeah. Okay, thank you so much on that. You know, I thought we might go there, but maybe I was hoping you might have seen a chink of light somewhere no I, I, I see chinks of light everywhere all the time yeah i'm sure i didn't, didn't convey them to the evening, <laughs> but i do yeah that's really good um so there's a microphone so there'll be a little bit of okay um, uh kerfuffle while we while we do that but is anybody in the audience we've got room for just a, a few questions want to um ask sadie speedy hand there at the back can you just hold on one moment for the microphone okay thank you um, when, you're, when you're talking about um, books kind of having a rhythm or shaping time in a certain way, um, how close do you feel to, I guess, the narrator of swing time? How close to, I mean, the narrator of swing time is a kind of non-person. So in that sense, I do feel quite close to it. Because <laughs> um, I, I, uh, 
I, I also I, I I'm always amazed by how um, how firmly people feel. You know, the way you hear people describing themselves all the time. Well, I'm the kind of person who I never. That's never occurred to me to say I'm the kind of person who does X, Y, or Z. So in that sense, yes. But it's I I mean, with this novel I just finished, like I, my husband was reading it, and you know, it's it's in the 18th, 19th century. Sorry, a bit tiny bit in the 18th century has a cast of so many people. But the real truth about novels like that is that they're all me. They're all me, everybody, the men, the women, the children, the dead, the blacks, the white, everybody. You take a little bit of yourself and you extrapolate from it. The bit of yourself which is angry, sad, hateful, miserable. You know, I take one little bit and I just run with it and imagine, just as an actor does, what if I was only this? Or what if I really felt this more than I do? Or it's just acting on the page, but covering a multitude, yeah. So they're, they're always a little bit of me, even if they don't look like me. There's always a bit of me in them. Up in the gallery or down down here, any further questions? Okay, yes, thank you. There's a lady in the second row. I just wanted to say thanks, especially for the first essay, which I thought was very profound, because I feel like we're, we're undergoing a collective trauma now post lockdown with in terms of a class dimension, you know, people who are out there in the virus having to deliver things to the laptop class, or people who lived alone and nearly lost their minds. And now there's a lot of kind of there's a sense of let's forget it, we got some things wrong, and it was fine. And there's just such huge trauma on every level though. And, and, and your disposition around time, both as both as something you need and you want more of, but as an assailant, I made me a bit tearful, actually. It was actually quite deep. And I've been starting to read the lockdown literature because, you know. Yeah, it's the beginning, right? And yeah. some of it's a bit too jaunty for me, <laughs> to be perfectly honest. And it's like, oh, I had loads of time and I got my novel done. And I'm, I'm just wanting, maybe just that's just me, but I'm wanting to also hear the really difficult, you know, grap trauma that people grappled with. And I felt like you really thank engaged you. with that. Thank you. I don't have thank a question. You. Just <laughs> thank you. No, thank you. <laughs> That image of the burning flat at the end of number ninety-eight—it just—it was very extreme. Like I, my, my um, actually, my father-in-law died of COVID, and then, but my other part, of my family were uh, anti-vaxxers. So it was one of those. I was caught in a very extreme. I'm sure, lots of people were in those kind of uh, double binds, which uh, uh, I think a lot of people had that experience. Very hard to uh, verbalize. Yeah. And hard to hard to come back from when right. it's been that intense. Yeah, hard of, to keep families together yeah, after yeah. after things like that. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Any there must be some more questions. Yes. Um yes, and then <laughs> John, who's in front. So hi Zadie. Hi. Thank, thanks for the evening. I wanted to be to say something about 50 years of women at Kings because um I remember when I got here in 1990, um, I think. Um, and um, I thought, thought the college was, that women had been here as long as I had because I was born back in 71, but I made a slight mistake because at 72 that they started taking women. And um, it felt very recent to me then because I was only 18, obviously, or 19 or something. And um, I really felt that in the atmosphere, so I ended up working on women's rights. I felt very, there were some great female tutors, more Dublin who's in the front, and Marion Butler. People are very inspiring and good. Um, icons of women coping in these strange communities that have had men for hundreds of years. I mean, I wonder if men had a, a celebration of 50 years of kings, that would have been sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> but I wonder if you, I mean, how do you feel about your experience of kings as a woman? Or do you feel, would you like your daughter, for example, to go somewhere like this? Or what, what do you think women can do to, it should be? I mean, I, I when I first came, I can remember being told by some boy at Peterhouse that they they had taken a coffin through the university when they let women in as a demonstration of the end of the university. I remember him telling me that. Um, so there were, there were lots. There were always boys like that who wanted to inform me of these kind of things. Um, and I, I mean, I had read a book called. I really didn't know anything about this place. The one person I knew had been to either Cambridge or Oxford was a, uh, a professor who lived in my neighborhood whose son happened to go to my school. 
I was asking him. Um, and uh, he gave me, I think, a book called The Cambridge Minds. I think that's what it was called. It was from the 50s. And um, I was completely fascinated by it, like read all the the profiles of it. I, of course, I was by myself reading a lot of um, Virginia Woolf. So I, I remember those two books together, reading Room of One's Own and, and reading The Cambridge Mind. And, and uh, so I knew, I knew exactly, because I've read Wolf, I knew exactly what to expect. I, I, you know, I believed her. And I, did, I knew it wouldn't have changed that much. Um, and, it, and it was exactly as she said. Um, and uh, I, I did think, I mean, I, it's, it's, I know it's a, probably a different attitude from young people now, probably rightly, but my mother from when I was very young had always said to me, just get what you need, you know, get whatever you need out of whatever situation. Um, and I, I always found that a very useful idea. And also the idea that it was all, it was very important to her that every, everything should be considered mine, everything. So if, if it was human culture, it was, it was mine. If it was on the planet, it belonged to me as much as anything from Jamaica or Africa or anywhere else. So I, I came with that point of view. Um, and I guess masculine culture, which is what I came into, I came with the view that this would also be mine. But it was where the rubber met the road when I got here, um, and it became clear that not only the way that men spoke and, and um, wrote, but also a certain kind of boys, you know, the public school boys, the way they spoke in these circles, uh, it was a real. Uh, <laughs> there was just no you couldn't get around them, you know. You couldn't you couldn't get a word in. You couldn't. There was no way around them at all. Um, and I think I failed my part ones partly because of um, the shock of it. Also, also the the uh, the ang it was kind of anger and humiliation. I was in my school, uh, two thousand kids, and maybe one kid or two get into Cambridge or Oxford every year. I think in my year it was two: one Cambridge, one Oxford. And I meet these boys, and I say, "Well, how many how many come from your school? UCS, which is just around the corner from my school." They're like mm, two thirds. Oh, what the fuck is going on here? <laughs> And then you meet these boys and like idiots. Like, what the hell is this possible? <laughs> so it was really um, all of that was uh, slightly infuriating. Um, but I I did take the policy of uh, after writing essays in ways that they didn't think were essays. I just thought, well, I'll write essays like you want me to write essays from the mount, as if I'm Levis himself. If that's going to work, let's do that. And so that's what I did. But you hope that that's not what people should have to do, right? They should be able to write in ways that interest them. John, I think this might need to be our, our final question. Um, um, I just wanted to ask you something, picking up on the end of your first essay that you kindly read to us, which was when you talked about, here's this novel made with love, as with banana bread made with love. But I was wondering about whether you would see Think, I'm thinking of my memories of first reading White Teeth as an experience also of being encouraged to care for characters, a range of characters. So are novels also a means of love or a means of love? <laughs> Absolutely. Teeth? And I, I really, um, the novel I've just finished, like I, uh, maybe it's just an experience of midlife, but I, I loved writing this book so much. I miss it. And the thing I miss so much is the people in it. I miss them. I mean, they're real people. It's a true story for the most part. But I'm just completely bereft, and I, I, I don't, I don't remember having that feeling. Not since I was very young, I, or I, I repressed it in the piles of literary theory. But this time, I really just thought, oh well, that's that. You know, seven years of my life. It was wonderful. Uh, you know, and it's over. Yeah. It's over now. <laughs> thank you. Thank, thank you. you so much um, for reading and for and for those wonderful reflections. Thank you to our audience thank here you. and online.